This year's national sale of thoroughbred yearlings at Trentham saw 196 horses go under the hammer for a total price of 96,000 pounds. Buyers from all over the Dominion, as well as agents for buyers in Australia and India, make the bidding keen. Throughout the world, yearling prices have soared in recent years, and prices here are highest since the annual sale was established 20 years ago. The most active competition from overseas came from the Coalfield trainer, S. Reed, who bought five coats. As a result of this year's sale, 25 horses will go to Australia and four to India, bringing in 21,000 pounds. Prices keep auctioneer Charlie Robertson working around the thousand mark. One thousand, one thousand, one thousand, one thousand. Come on now, what's the heads doing? Can't you tune them up? One thousand, one thousand. Lovely coat, great disposition, everything in front of him. Nice foul, give him time, he'll do anything for you. And while he goes, seven hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred, twelve hundred. Racing results have shown this season that many leading winners have been bought in this sale ring. And today's offerings from the Trelawney Stud, Alton Lodge and Windsor Park keep the buyers busy. <laughs> And here's the highlight of the sale. All eyes are on the Foxbridge Ann Acre coat that went for 3,000 guineas, a record price for New Zealand. This coat, a full brother to Bridge Acre and Al Surratt, bred at the Trelawney Stud, Cambridge, was bought by Mr. A. Winter, who is reported as acting as agent for Bing Crosby. Fancy paying 3,000 guineas for a coat so that Bob Hope can make a joke about him. Anyone looking at our forests wouldn't think that one of our problems of the future is a possible timber shortage. Some of our forests were planted only 30 or 40 years ago, and today we're using up timber quicker than it can possibly grow. But we're not getting the most out of the trees we are cutting down. Some of the timber is too soft. It's only second grade timber that's just waiting to be ravaged by borer. This is what happens to it, rotten. Thanks to this little fellow, who's dug himself in so that you can't see the wood for the borer. Meet the original borer, the fellow that leaves a pile of powdered wood underneath the wardrobe when you're not looking. But scientists are getting on his trail properly these days. At Owairaka, Auckland, they're searching for a method of making all wood proof against him. Various kinds of wood from various places are examined closely. Every day the timber is gone over carefully and the borers collected and put into bottles, which is all very scientific and very tough luck on the borers. Next, samples of wood to be tested are first treated with different types of preservatives. The wood is put into a vacuum dish and the air extracted leaving it surrounded with a whole lot of nothing. Finally, it's saturated in preservative while still in the vacuum and then removed for a lengthy drying process. it's ready for the borer to have a go at. It's rescued from the soaking and sealed up in a cage with a number of borer in each cage. It's taped down and left for six weeks. In six weeks, under constant temperature and humidity, the eggs of the borer hatch out, if the preservative has failed. Here's a cine micrograph picture of borer eggs and a grain of wood. To check the value of the preservative, the scientist counts the number of these eggs in each block using a microtome that shaves the block down, exposing the eggs. All this is how science is waging war against the borer that lays the egg, that hatches the grub, that riddles the timber, and wrecks the houses that we build. Once more, the New Zealand division is in the depths of an Italian winter. Again, it's leaden skies, greasy roads, and ditched transport. Once more, the engineers are fighting the Italian mud. 
With branches and tree trunks, they're filling the ruts and bridging the bogs, doing everything to keep these vital roads open. Along the roads come the heavy tanks of the New Zealand Division. For five weeks, the 8th Army has been held up at Payenza, a German stronghold on the road to Bologna. Now the heavily armoured Kiwi Division has been called up to punch forward with their shock troop tactics from the British 1 bridgehead. Less than a thousand yards from the German line, our infantry find an Italian family living in a haystack. These unfortunate people are homeless, and this the only shelter they can find. After a night barrage, infantry wait for the final assault and mortars past the machine gun nests. Only machine gun fire comes from Faenza. It sounds as if Jerry, finding himself outgunned and outflanked, has pulled out. Cautiously, the New Zealand infantry advance. Last night's barrage finished this bridge, but there's still a way across the wreckage. Into the silent town, they go in single file. Any one of these buildings may conceal a sniper or a machine gun. From the first inhabitants they see, they find out where the Germans sowed their mines, and the engineers set to work to clear the streets. This is a job where you've got to take your time. Jerry's out to catch the bloke who's in a hurry. And until the mines are cleared, the infantry have to wait. Chatting to the Italian partisan soldier who led them into the town fills in time while waiting. Meanwhile, the artillery is rolling into the city. For these boys, this is one more town to their credit in the tough northward drive. And from cellars come the dazed townspeople to see what is left of homes, to gather wood, and whatever may be useful. German demolitions, as much as our bombardment, are responsible for this destruction. Once more, there are prisoners. These from the 90th Panzer Grenadiers, old opponents of the Kiwi Division in both Africa and Italy. Of these, some are very young, some are arrogant, some amused, and some suspiciously friendly. But for all of them, it's defeat. And for the hard-fighting New Zealanders, it's another well-earned victory. Mm -hmm.